So my name is Vincent. I work for um, Ingenico ePayments. And uh, yeah, my name is Gerben Uitenbult. I work for a very small company called uh, Accenture. Probably <laughs> never heard of it. Um, it has around 400,000 people. Um, my role there is I'm the DevOps lead uh, from uh, what they call Gallia. But it means Germany, of uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, France. So the people that are still in the UA. So, uh, <laughs> too soon? No. But um, that's a little bit um, where I come to. Vincent, what is this? In yeah, let me stuff? introduce a little bit um, what Ingenico is all about, to give you a little bit of a context. So, Ingenico is a French company. It was founded in 1980. Um, and it's basically known for manufacturing payment terminals. So if you go to the supermarket, gas station, or you check out in the hotel, there's a terminal where you put your card in, you enter your PIN code, the correct one, I hope, and then um, uh, the payment is all being taken care of. The counter right now is on 32 million terminals, so you can imagine what volumes of, uh, of payment is going through their systems. Um, Ingenico is um, operating right now in 170 countries, has 6,000 employees, and uh, recently they decided to also enter the market of uh, online payments. So I worked previously for a company called Global Collect, which was acquired by Ingenico in 2014, uh, which is based in Amsterdam. Another payment service provider, Ogon in Belgium, was also acquired by Ingenico uh, recently, and now together, jointly, we are the Ingenico ePayments. Um, and this talk will be focusing purely on the Ingenico ePayments platform. So. Let's take a look at what, what is a payment service provider, actually. <laughs> OK, so let me, let me try to explain that in two slides. So um, I can't give any names, but imagine you, are, um, you, you have a gaming platform and you, you, you sell games online. Customers go to your website, they, download the, they pay, they download the game, and basically, since you're online, you want to sell these, uh, these products all around the globe. But if you, I mean, if you have customers in Chile, Alaska, maybe in China, Japan, wherever, and uh, you want to be able, your end consumers, to pay in, their, in some kind of local payment system, or they need to pay in, uh, I don't know, pesos, in dollars, in, uh, in euros, in pounds, you would have to implement a lot of payment solutions. And, um, and that's kind of what I try to depict in this picture over here. Uh, you would have to implement all of these solutions, you have to maintain all of these solutions, while what you would want to do is just focus on selling your games online, right? Um, so that's a lot of uh, complexity there. Where you see the red arrows is basically where my team within the company comes in. So the previous presenters were all CTOs, CIOs, I'm not anything like that. Uh, I just run uh, several scrum teams, which are basically responsible for the platform that does all the uh, online processing for these payments. So it's very critical. Uh, those are the red lines. The gray lines is reporting. So you can imagine if you would, in a regular situation, have uh, payments uh, going on in 50 countries, for example, you would receive a lot of reports, a lot of feedback on this. And then there's the funds and all kinds of different currencies. So what do we do? is we take away that complexity. And uh, we provide access to one single API to a multitude of payment products all around the globe. So that could be uh, credit card transactions, uh, bank transfers in, uh, in dollars or in euros or in uh, Swiss franc, doesn't matter. Could be PayPal because you want to integrate with PayPal, Combini in Japan, uh, Citrus in um, India. I know that. <laughs> um, and we just provided you through one single API. So you only have to uh, implement this and hardly any maintenance. Earlier this year, we went live with um, uh, REST API, which is really nice. If you go to our website, you go to the developer hub, you can, uh, you can just take a look at it. You can all see all the specs. We provide you SDKs for iOS, for Android, that you could just use and implement it in your own, uh, in your own app, also for Java. Uh, so it's really easy to, uh, to integrate with us. And we take away all this complexity which means we own all the complexity, <laughs> which is a little bit of a headache for us. Uh, I'll get to that later on. Uh, reporting, everything is consolidated in one, uh, one single feedback to you. There is a service you can log in, you can see all the payments, you can uh, uh, trigger refunds, etc. And as far as the funds go, uh, we would even take care for you to uh, aggregate everything into one single currency in one account, wherever you want it. So no longer payments in 150 countries, all in one place. 
you can imagine, so now I go to the numbers. I never do this presentation, so I went to the marketing team. <laughs> and, uh, and we processed billions of, uh, of flow. And you can imagine that we cannot suffer one minute of downtime or 30 seconds of downtime. Our merchants, our customers would be complaining right away. Uh, so it's really crucial for us that we uh, are stable, we maintain our uptime, and we don't introduce any issues on production. Um, so we process billions of flow. I thought it was a lot until I saw the presentation of Barclays yesterday. But <laughs> they process like this every, every day. Um, and we only do this with about 800 employees, which I think is pretty nice, pretty lean. Um, so I'm proud of that. You can see a number of customers on the right side. And um, there's one merchant or customer that we would have like to mention. It's Tidal. I don't know if anyone heard about Tidal, Tidal before. It's like, like Spotify, but then owned by Jay-Z. And uh, you can imagine they do some um, exclusive uh, launches of albums. And if a guy like that just tweets, hey, my new album is online right now, only on Tidal, we get pff, the peak of traffic right away. So we also need to be able to deal with that. Fabian will talk more about that later on. Um, shift away from the monolith. So all those red arrows I showed you before. Um, the platform we have right now is not as old as 1994, but uh, you can imagine that uh, back then uh, we were a front runner. Um, but right now, uh, everything is in, in one, was in one single big monolith. And uh, some years ago, we decided to take it apart because we really needed to move into microservices to be able to, uh, to keep up with, uh, with uh, well, also with the competition. First, we were, we were one of the first, and now competition is really fierce. And we have this one big, huge application that we need to maintain to do all these process, all these um, payments in. So we started to chop it up in pieces. I think everyone knows this picture of the elephant. And uh, we've been doing that together with, uh, with Accenture. We're on a journey together. We're not there yet, but we've made some huge steps over the last uh, periods. And um, yeah, you can imagine that it's not been easy chopping up this monolith in small pieces, uh, migrating bit by bit, and still being able to handle uh, up to 1,000 transactions per second if needed. So if anything would go wrong anywhere, we would have immediate impact, and we could even lose our business because we can't just we can't suffer a lot of downtime. Um, Gaben is one of our DevOps champions, I would say. That's a word I learned yesterday. <laughs> and um, I wasn't so much into the scene, but I'm convinced now, uh, so to say. And, um, and we moved into a more agile way of working, and we're really getting the benefits from it now. Um, I think uh, I'll stick to that, because otherwise you don't have any time anymore. Yes. <laughs> so let me move um, to the next step. Here yes, you go. thanks. So, um, Vincent had explained a little bit, a bit, bit the challenge. So um, they asked us to come together in a journey to, to, to make this possible. Well, um, so first of all, indeed, the Beyonce, for example, released two months ago. Um, so, um, and then everybody, probably some of you as well, just click on and want to sell that album as soon as possible, or get this album as soon as possible. Um, what happens then, of course, is uh, huge amounts of load. It also needs to get paid. That's where our system comes in. That's one. However, um, we're handling also credit cards, PayPal, so everything to do with payments. Um, so we have a lot of regulation, security, that kind of things. Um, however, uh, the company, as in Genico, wanted to go really further, like the Spotify's, the Netflix's, the Facebooks that you see here. So, and they asked us to go, to go together with the journey. So I, I, I told, I asked them from, hey, I feel also a round thing called the Dead Star. I can build that also. That's probably easier than what you're asking now <laughs> from me. So, um, however, they wanted to still do it. So I said, uh, okay, let's let's see how we do it. So, um, next 20 minutes, I have, um, yeah. We'll discuss how we did it together. It was really a combination of, of us working together to get this done. Um, for me, I've presented similar things as well for, uh, for our board. And uh, then it took six hours. So hopefully today you will be home earlier than the six hours. But let's see how far we can go. Um, so first part is um, you heard about the Spotify, the Netflix, and the Facebook almost uh, the last two days. Every, everyone talks about these unicorns and that kind of things. To be honest, uh, 
I don't think they are unicorns. For me, they are just horses, and I uh, probably with duct tape to put a horn on it because unicorns for me are, are myths. So, and for me, it's not the case. So, what a lot of companies try to do is uh, copy what um, those unicorns are doing. So, that's not what we did. We looked at those companies and decided from, hey, what can we learn from that, from them, and just, yeah have that within our system, within our ecosystem, within everything, what can we really pick from those ones? So we, ha we have a four, uh, we divided this huge undertaking in three areas. So organizational cultural charts, we took the Spotify example, architecture, everybody, microservices, cool. We looked at Netflix and continuous delivery, we really looked at uh, how Facebook does it. So um, <laughs> development, how you build it, is really about team, right? We talked about it co continuously. Um, however, for us it's different because we are, of course, are a vendor and we work together. So we constantly discuss from, hey, but we're in this journey together. So if I have a problem, I have one of those bi bi bicycles and I'm there and I'm ha having a hard time. It's um, you're one of the guys, not the yeah, bicycle. Yeah, I'm one of the guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, it's we need to be to do to work together to get uh, across the finish. And if Vincent has to say and just kicks me and uh, and that kind of thing is not the way we want to work, right? And that's why I like the the, the Spotify model. Uh, Ron yesterday from IG also talked a little bit about it, so I'm not going into that de deeply. But what we really wanted to focus on is. Um, our teams, we, we want to create them as feature teams and should be like mini startups, self-organizing, working really end-to-end uh, -end and take the responsibility. And not me as a manager or Vincent as a manager just pushing around. No, it's the team's responsibility. And uh, all the rest, infrastructure, uh, the app platform, iOS, etc. all those teams need to be enablers. They should be... Um, making it possible for features to bring faster to production and not the other way around, what most of us are doing. Yeah. Um, so this is the goal. So, cool. This was our <coughs> organization, how we started it. So on the top, we had a product owner. Um, we had a project manager, like we all do. And then we had vendor one. And we had another vendor as well. And one is doing development, the other in tests. One is mostly combined in Mumbai. All the tests is in, in Pune. And we have some project manager onshore. And we have, I think, at the time, one developer onshore as well. And uh, maybe a little bit more, but and a few testers. But it was just a mix all over the place. And if something goes wrong, finger pointing, no, it was the other vendor, the test is incorrect, the development is incorrect. Um, then we still have operations. We have what we call operations level one and level two. Um, for us, since we are very hard regulated, it's for us impossible as a as you guys really would like to have as DevOps people, continuous delivery, push it to production. We are not allowed to do so from regulation. We don't have the right and we will never get the right to push a button and push it on production. Because that's what we call PCI compliant, it's all regulated, so we need to, to deal with that. So um, this is the current situation where we are. We have been pushing the teams very hard to be self-sufficient. So we took this Spotify model with the cool stuff, with the tribes and the squads and all kinds of shit, and we did the first thing we did, we removed all those strange names, <laughs> right? And nobody knows what it is, a squad, the tribe, I don't know, let's just call it a domain. And that's where Vincent comes in. Vincent is this guy we call the front office product owner. It's more like a domain manager, so he's leading the domain. For me, yeah, I don't know what for title I have. I call it development lead or delivery lead or whatever. Um, and then we have also, since we have this big of, uh, of offshoring, we have people there as well that are the leads. However, um, we are not the old school managers. We are call them servant leaders, I think I heard that yesterday. We are really pushing the teams to take ownership. We still have on the top what we call projects, um, but currently we are finalizing these projects as well because the teams for us are the ones that are end-to-end -end responsible. So we have really the feature teams where we have people from the business you put in a team and make them responsible. What we call projects is more over multiple domains, and we still have this team end-to-end -end responsible for this domain. So we have some projects, and the other one, what we call fast track, is really about um, teams that can uh, that have uh, functionality that's less than uh, two to three weeks of work. Else yeah. we go through more to our project team. So you need to see, for example, um, 
fraud. Uh, for, for us, fraud is very important. So we have a team very dedicated to handle this fraud functionality. So really about having a feature team. Oh, but it'd be nice to mention here as well is that uh, we used to have a very classic vendor-client uh, yeah. relationship that's gone. That's the first thing we moved to the table. So in these teams, there are people from Ingenico, there's people from Accenture, people from other vendors collaborating in those, in those teams. We really don't care who's paying their salary. We just want to make sure that they work together as a team and deliver what they need to deliver. And yeah. that's really important. And so we, we've also gone from, hey, this whole platform, we have a development team, then we deliver something to a test team, and they work with it. No, they are now one team. So people, that, and we scatter them, so people that are sitting in Pune and have one tester that sits in, in team one, for example, and we have a developer sitting in team one, yep. and the guy next to him is sitting in team two. And we are constantly, we have open line communication and that kind of thing, and it worked great for us. Instead of just having an offshore team and doing some development stuff and then moving it to testing, now it's really about feeling as a team. So, and still, we still have what we call the, the PCI compliant environment, and we're really working closely with, together with them. They have a really hard, hard job. Um, of course, about the security and that kind of thing. So we're really involved now with, with, with them as well. Daily, we have calls with them every morning to discuss how we're going to set up the environments and that kind of things. And to be honest, going forward, those are the points also where we will focus on, to see what can we do with the regulation to get more of those people in our team. So we can really start pushing to production from the teams. And the projects as well, we discussed about it as well. We are currently uh, doing a proof of concept with one team that we really want to remove whole projects from there. So that's a little bit the setup we currently have. Yeah. Then, the other point I discussed was architecture, right? Um, not sure if you can see it, what this is, but this is a Lego contraption, it's called. It's, I, I'm, a, I'm a big nerd, I, I, I confess, I like Lego. So what they have here is, uh, once in a while, they have a conference, a little bit like this, and they all build a Lego machine, and um, there goes uh, footballs and soccer balls through their system, um, but they discuss exactly one ball needs to go to one system to the other one um, every second. So they have a very clear, what we call, interface. And we really like that from, uh, from, from a standard, because everybody talks from architecture, it should be like Lego. You put a few blocks in it, you can reuse it, but you can build everything. So uh, that's why I like this picture. But everybody talks now currently about uh, microservices, right? Um, yeah, we have this monolithic, we need to split it up, etc. Um, I'm not going to discuss it, because this morning there was a great discussion about what microservices is. So I'm not going to repeat it. Um, However, the question that I still didn't, to be honest, really saw during most of the presentation is from, hey, today we have a monolithic and tomorrow we have microservices. How do you get there? How, what do you do? And in this regulation, so um, this is how we do it. Um, we have a big monolithic application and we use what we call the strangler pattern. Uh, there's a story Martin Fowler uh, wrote about it, really look into it. So instead what we do, instead of just Building a complete platform, this is a platform that is a million lines of code, so it's huge, we can't just do it. No, we are slicing it. Um, I took the example here, for example, for um, getting the order. So for some reason, everybody, our clients, want to get an order. What the status is, I don't know why. I think if you pay us, it's enough, they but okay. They want to their money. Yeah, <laughs> yes, they want to know where the money is. Um, so um, get order status is one of our main calls. So it's a small call. Um, so what we did, we created a complete new platform next to the already existing one, but create only the basis. So think about uh, logging, uh, exception handling, uh, everything on an application server, so completely clean, uh, what we at the time called the clean bucket, and we slowly removed first the get order status to that. So really focus on one particular element and get it running. And then we have, since we have worked in so much high peak load, uh, and see how it works. And that way, we could slowly slice our application. So the strangler pattern is about from, hey, you have a tree, and you build a small one uh, within it, and then slowly it kills the current existing tree. So that's a little bit what we did with the, with the strangler pattern. Um, okay, so we started with that, and how did we then move from there to the other one? So we, we continued that journey, and um, instead of just having really this big monolithic and just only strangling that, we slowly created services out of it. So really pick up particular functionality, 
and say, for, okay, can we isolate this from what we have already existing, or should we move it to a different service? So with a lot of them we now have, uh, I think a whole platform is now 30, 35 applications, something like that, the whole platform. So we really, instead of just only the Strangler pattern from our core, core business service, we also created new trees, right? That's a little bit how we did it, how we combined it. That's the picture on the bottom, right? Yeah, that's a nice picture <laughs> on the bottom. And uh, as you can see, we are doing a lot of functionality. Uh, PayPal, for example, is an example there. Uh, authorization, and the other ones are all different bank modules that we have uh, below it. Because that's, of course, our um, issue as well. Behi besides that, we are talking about so much load and performance and that kind of things. We have to do with tons of different systems. And we need to connect most of them to what we call providers, acquirers, banking systems. Well. Some of them are almost like uh, smoke signals, right? That you need to send over the line. And not all APIs or that kind of thing. So we need to deal with all kinds of different um, yeah, technologies and that kind of things. So, um, okay, cool, now we have that. Um, here's an example of what we, now we have a service. Um, what we did here was an example from, hey, we do the get order status and we fire as much load on it as, as humanly possible. Um, this is on a test environment, it's not uh, Netflix style that we do it on production. We have there Docker, Amazon Cloud, everything is uh, up and running currently um, in this new framework. And what you can see is that around, uh, yeah, on the left side you see how many transactions per second we fire on this one simple machine. We just fire um, a lot of load on it, it, it handled around 1,000 transactions per second, and we saw a trigger, a trigger came up from, hey, it's above 50% of CPU, uh, create an instance from scratch. Not existing, switching load over or anything, create a new instance completely from scratch. Automatically Took a few minutes. Triggered. Sorry, yeah. And um, so it creates it, and certainly um, we see it has been created, and we can handle 2,000 transactions per second. And that's a little bit where our situation where we want to go is from, hey, because I don't know if there's somewhere, somewhere in this world, uh, some guy does, uh, I don't know, the newest uh, World of Warcraft game comes out and uh, they didn't inform us. Well, probably they, they, that one uh, they did. But then suddenly you see a huge amount of peak load, right? And that's what we need to deal with. Um, last point, commitment to deliver. So that's where we focus on. We took the Facebook example and um, I really, um, yeah, there's a link in most of my slides as well. I really would... Um, yeah, ask you to really look at that link. It's really good. It's uh, Chuck Rossi explaining how the Facebook me mechanism works from going to production. Um, what is what? I, what we? Why we took this one as an example as a baseline for where we wanted to go? They release every week. They have a huge um, a platform. They have still a monolithic, so we try to use it first uh, from that one, uh, and they can deliver twice a week, of twice a day to production as well. One big release and twice uh, per week to production. So. Uh, what our situation is, well, we're running multiple projects at the same time. So um, you guys are probably doing the same thing as well. So really focusing on yeah, having more streams at the same time and that kind of things. Um, so releasing to production, we did that less than 10 times a year. Um, uh, months from when some, guy, some poor developer committed code and sent it to production, took months. Um, very high re defect ratio because what we did at the time was if we put something on production that went wrong, we rolled it back, but we only remo removed that fix from the code and uh, it was a mess. And um, yeah, the deployment itself took days, sometimes even weeks at the time. Um, so the problem what you have is if you do these multi multiple streams, also uh, one project is trying to fix something, it's rolled back from production and the other one is late as well and then yeah, the whole planning for all those projects will be uh, delayed. Oh, we're just building up dependency on dependency on dependency, and in the end, nothing went to production anymore. Yeah, correct. So what you get, you get a collision, yeah. a full collision on, uh, on the environment. So how did we solve it? Well, very simple. What did the train guys did? A station. It's as simple as the train station. That the train or bus or whatever, does, well, bus maybe, but the train or, or flight doesn't wait for you. So for us, the schedule is Tuesday and Thursday. Sometimes a little bit different, but we're trying to focus on it. But that's the way to do it. So if you're too late for your release uh, that goes out of the door, then you're too late. You take, take the next train, right? And that's a little bit how we implement it, not just going from, hey, we wait everything and that kind of things. Instead of now, we have one of the most regular uh, 
yeah, systems probably in the world. We have most of the credit cards, probably the big, one of the biggest database bases in the world from credit cards. And we now are releasing to production at least every week. Sometimes twice, sometimes three times a week in exceptional cases, but normally around once a week. Um, yeah, it took, and uh, now it takes like a week to, uh, sometimes even less, uh, to go through production to our environment. We have automatic test cases that can be run, 20,000 of them can be run within uh, yeah, minutes on our, on our platform. Uh, we have a lot lower defect uh, ratio, and uh, the deployment itself takes a lot less than hours. And we can even, even speed that up. And um, yeah, so instead of just constantly going forward and having a lot of teams, we just have also, again, for the, for the developers under us, just one code base. No, we work pretty strict on the teams. Yes. Because if they're not checking in time or if it doesn't work, then uh, yeah, they miss a week. And the next slot is next week. Yeah. And uh, that's the, way, the only way to ensure we, we keep moving changes to production, on and on and on. Yeah. So, Klein, uh, uh, one of the last slides is just a little bit how our environment then really looks like. Um, our complete test environment uh, is currently running in the cloud. We have, you see the tools, I think you saw most of them already today. We have that running on what we call the ACP Accenture Cloud Platform, but we're trying to migrate that probably as well. Um, we have our environment there up and running. We do have our on-premise uh, environment. Um, one thing to mention is that we are looking into new ways of setting up our on-premise environment as well. However, what we did, because you still see, what I would see here, there's a big line there between the cloud and on-premise. How do you handle that? Well, real simple. We just had two or three persons uh, that we put together from operations and development and make this automatically. So as you can see, almost our whole environment is fully automatic. Uh, Semi-automatic, I mean, we still need to get approvals. So that's the only thing that is stopping us. Our deployments are completely fully optimized. Our operations guy did a great job. Um, and what we saw in the beginning, we had level one and level two uh, ops. The level one, to be honest, doesn't exist anymore. They are all in our teams. We only have the PCI compliance. Yeah, but forward. now sometimes we go in one day from integration to pre-production to production. And that's yeah. something that a year ago was unimaginable. <laughs> it was more like a month. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, some of the lessons learned, um, talked about in the beginning as well, um, really vendor versus client relationship, um, uh, it's, a, it's a combination, huh? we need to do it together. And in the beginning we had a lot of struggles and that kind of things, but that's really important. Um, the other one, no separation of teams, uh, mixed onshore and offshore, um, but also a very important part that has changed our world as well, is really when we had a business person that was really responsible for it on the floor in the team, so not an IT product owner, but someone from the business end to end responsible. No, but for that's that. something that's been happening over the last months because we've been trying to well put the teams together. So we've been just going to the business, pull the people in, and now sitting with us, and that really makes a change because uh, otherwise, sometimes you would have uh, uh, how do you say surprises that the business <laughs> says, "Ah, oh, this is not what we wanted." So we said, "Okay, just come sit with us," and before it ships, you say it's okay. And you, you define what we're going to build, and it yeah. works. And, and for us, uh, a few things is what are really important for is indeed uh, don't use feature branches. That was for us, we tried it, break everything, just one branch, one branch only. And still our teams are discussing, hey, Gabriel, can we have a branch? Hell no. And <laughs> absolutely not, one branch for everything. One ring to rule them all. And um, overall, for me, is um, yeah, we had a lot of regulation about offshore teams and et cetera, the, the delivery. Um, what we did in the beginning was really a little bit strict. We said about autonomy as well. We started really strict, and now we are in a situation that we are loosening up the teams. So to make sure that everybody looks at the same way, and now we, ha and we did that with automatic tooling, about quality, about uh, performance, everything. Everything for us is, is automated. Um, Last up, what are we still then from, hey, cool cool journey, what do we still need to do then? Um, one is we are pushing through getting these feature teams up and running. So That's purely really independent one. Um, the other one is our development speed. Since now we have a new platform, we have heavily invested in creating a new, new platform, we need to go faster, faster and faster. Um, cloud uh, uh, possibilities, I think that is, yeah, should be quite clear. Uh, <coughs> metrics is what we have, to be honest, in the journey have been lacking was a little bit about the metrics, how much we improved and that kind of things. That's something we need to do going forward. Um, 
last point, common is law. I think um, for me, it is both ways. Um, on one hand, it is not only that you need to change your organization, sometimes you also need to change your architecture, everything around it, it's both ways. If you really want to go forward, you need to change both. And um, question that I wanted to ask, what are we still looking for? Um, yeah, you can already see it, PCR compliance in the, in the cloud. How are we going to do it? We don't know yet. We are investigating it. We'll see what happens. And um, yeah, and then same for with Docker. Yeah, our environment is quite um, regulated, strict, um, has a lot of rulings and that kind of things. But our main issue, it's that everything you have as well. However, we have tremendous loads going through our system. Yeah. Really tremendous with high amounts of peaks. And I think that's it for me, Vincent, something. Yeah, if you give me the, the clicker for the last slide. Yes. <laughs> so thanks for the really great explanation, Angevia. So um, something I want to mention, because we were discussing this yesterday, while we were sitting here listening to the other presentations, actually something really big was happening uh, back in the office, because we've been going from this monolith to all the small services. We chopped it down into, I think, even more than 25 uh, different services right now. Yeah, and one of the last big migrations was taking place yesterday while we were here. And we were following on WhatsApp what was going on, and everything went smooth. And I was really, really proud on the teams. So if the guys are watching, thank you guys. And uh, I think a couple of months ago, we wouldn't, this is something we wouldn't have trusted. We would have been there. We would have canceled this. We, we would have been there in the office. But everything went fine. The teams took care of it all together. For, uh, they pushed everything from integration, pre-prod, production, uh, moved the flow. And uh, to give you an impression, I think it was about 10% of the entire flow that moved yesterday, which if you looked at the numbers before, is a lot of payments. So we were sweating a bit, but everything went fine. So it really proves for me that uh, the direction we've chosen is, uh, is working and that we together have to continue with the journey we, um, we started. Last slide, we're Dutch, so we like this guy, <laughs> for stopper. Yay! <laughs> I heard today he crashed his car, but that doesn't matter. Shit. Anyway, I think it's really important to, um, uh, don't be afraid of change. Change will always be there. You need to embrace it. You will always need to change, 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 because if you stop doing that, you, you lose, basically. So uh, like these guys of Red Bull, they put a 17-year-old uh, guy in the car, maybe he was even 16 years old, took a lot of gut to do that, but it paid out. They had their first victory since a long time. Yeah. Um, didn't and, even uh, have his driver's license. Yeah, I didn't even have his driver's license. And we're doing the same thing. I mean, we have a risky business. We need to make sure it goes fine, but we don't step back on improving and changing the way we, uh, we work. And um, that's it. So thank you all. Yeah, if there's any questions, then uh, we're around still for probably one hour. Just, just grab us, we're quite yep. open. So uh, thank you all.